Okay, well, good morning, dear church family. It's, wow, there's a lot of people here today. Did you see that? Oh, friends, I got to tell you, I would be so blessed and grateful to God if there's just one person here that was interested in having the Bible opened. But that, that excitement is multiplied many times here because there's so many here today. That's great. Thank you, and God bless you for coming out. We want to get uh, into the book of Genesis today, but I just, uh, because of that first song, I was directed to uh, the book of Romans. Uh, that first song said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Remember that? That comes from the book of Romans, uh, chapter 8, in verse 31. Paul says, if God be for us, who can be against us? But you need to keep reading there. Verse 32 says, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You see, whatever precious doctrine you're interested in, it's, it's attached, welded to the cross. We never want to get far from the cross. The love of God displayed in the cross. That's why we're here, because we love the Lord that loved us. He, he loved us first, right? And you kind of get the sense, you know what? God loves us not because we're just so lovely, <laughs> but God's love towards us tells us something about his great heart, you know? And you kind of get the idea, Lord, I need to see the world the way you see it. Because the greatest command was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus said the second greatest command is just like it. You're to love your neighbor as yourself. And we will not do that if we don't see the world the way God sees it. And guess how that's going to happen? You've got to read the Bible. You go to the Bible and you learn the Bible. And the Bible is your lens now. You look out into the world. Sorry. <laughs> you look out into the world. And you ask God to show you what it is you're looking at. God, explain these things to me. And you know, if you know the Bible, you're, you're going to start seeing the world the right way. Right? The, what's the best example I can think of? I always use fossils as my example. You dig up a fossil. Who, who doesn't know what a fossil is? <laughs> you go to the museum and you see fossils. You dig up a fossil, it doesn't talk to you. You have to interpret that fossil. You have to give it meaning. And if you're a Bible-believing Christian and you take God at his word, guess what? You're going to think that fossil was probably formed maybe in Noah's flood, not millions and billions of years ago, not evidence for the evolution story. You see, it colors everything. I look at my neighbor, I don't see a descendant from the apes. I see a beautiful human being created in the image and likeness of God with intrinsic value because he's made in God's image. Okay? Do you see how God's word helps you to interpret everything that you experience in this life. But guess what, friends? It means you've got to know the Bible. It means you've got to start at the beginning and go all the way to the end. Learn it. And that's what we're going to try to do. So go, please, to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. After a big, long, lengthy introduction here. <laughs> Genesis, chapter 1. And under God, we're going to ask for his help here because we're going to try to get through the Bible. And it's going to be very difficult, I think, because uh, what a challenge not to get bogged down, to ha yet to have some momentum, and yet not to skip over things that are really, really essential to us. So let's, um, with God's help, get into the book of Genesis. Well, page one in your Bible, cha chapter one, verse one, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to get bogged down on every last verse that we read, but that verse we need to stop and really, really think about. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That is, in my estimation, the most important verse of the entire Bible. Okay? Now, I can hear the, I can hear the um, resistance to that by some Christians. They might think that John 3.16 is the most important verse of the Bible. Who doesn't know John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's John 3.16. Uh, yes, Precious, it's called the golden text of the Bible. But that, that verse, John 3.16, is useless and worthless unless we see it in the light of Genesis 1.1. We don't care about just any God that claims to love us or claims to have sent a sacrifice for us. We don't care about gods like that. The God that sent his son into the world has to be the creator. And that's important. Okay, go to Jeremiah, the 10th chapter. We're going to look at Jeremiah 10 very quickly. Now, I think we've probably looked at this already at some point in the past, but let's look at it again now because this is essential. Jeremiah chapter 10. Okay? Jeremiah, the prophet. 
chapter 10 and verse 10. 10, 10. And uh, Jeremiah, you know, uh, around 600 B.C., he was visited by the Word of God himself. And who is the Word of God? The Lord Jesus Christ. He got a visit from the Lord Jesus himself. And we know that because the Word showed up to Jeremiah and reached out his hand and touched him. Ah, okay, let's see what God had to say to Jeremiah. Chapter 10, verse 10. Here it is. But the Lord, that's Jehovah, Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, the only God there is. But the Lord is the true God. You see that? That means all competing deities, I'm sorry, but all competing deities are fake. They're not true. Period. The Lord is the true God. He is the living God. Again, that means all competing gods, deities, whatever you want, anything out there in competition with God for your affections and worship, they're fake. And they're dead. Or inanimate, at, at any rate. The Lord is the true God, the living God. He is an everlasting king. In Hebrew, literally, he's the king of eternity. And again, the all competing deities are what? They're finite. To the extent that they have any existence at all, they're finite. They came into existence, and guess what? They're going to perish one day, and God's going to tell us that. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble, and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. Verse 11, thus shall you say to them, Jeremiah, this is what you say to the nations. And this is in Aramaic now, not Hebrew. This is the language of the nations. This is so people get the point. This is so Canada gets the point, so Winnipeg gets the point. That we all get the point here and share it with our friends, neighbors, loved ones. Thus shall you say to them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. Now that's dangerous. Uh, you set your affections, your worship, your allegiance to anything but the true and living God, that, guess what? That God's going to perish from off the earth and from under the heavens, and you'll perish with him. That, that's a stern warning, isn't it? Isn't it? And as we read the Bible and set everything in context, we get the message, don't we, that God doesn't want that for you and me and our neighbors and loved ones. God sent his son into the world to save the world, not to condemn the world. Do you think God takes pleasure? I mean, that, that's Ezekiel 18. God does not take pleasure in the death of him that dies. Repent, he says. Turn and live. But you will not live, really. Really, you're not really alive spiritually in any good sense of the world, uh, word here or in heaven, unless you have a love relationship with the God of creation. And you're going to come to him his way by way of the cross. It says in verse 12, He hath made the earth by his power, he has established the world by his wisdom, and he has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Okay, that's Genesis 1.1. You can go back to Genesis 1.1. Let's take a look at that. The God of creation. Um, it's in Galatians, the fourth chapter, where Paul reminds those foolish Galatians. He says, look, in the past you did service to those which are not by nature God, or which by nature are no God. You see, you can call anything you want a God if you, if you want to. Wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, whatever. Call yourself a God if you want. But that you, you did not create the heavens and the earth. Those other things, those competing deities, did not create the heaven and the earth, and they will perish from off the earth, from under these heavens. Now, I can just anticipate this, too. Uh, Non-believers are going to say, you know, uh, that, those are pretty tough words. You're standing there, and you're making these declarations, like you're right and everybody else is wrong, and how narrow and bigoted and <laughs> narrow-minded you are, you know, for saying these things. Uh, but that's the nature of truth, isn't it? I mean, when you make a truth statement, you necessarily exclude competing claims from being true. Do we have a budget for a new... Uh... Um, but anyways... Only one God who is God by nature, he's the creator. 
And the, the resistance is you, you sound like you're very narrow and bigoted and, and all the rest of it. But that is the nature of a truth claim. If you, you say something, you, you think it's true, you necessarily exclude all competing antagonistic claims. They, those things can't be true. That's just logic, right? But I want you to think about the alternative here. I mean, if I say in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and that's what the Bible says, and I stand on that, and if you're a Christian, you stand on that, right? What are the alternatives? You only have two. If you reject Genesis 1-1, you only have two alternatives. You, number one, you're going to say the universe, all of it, has always been. It's eternal. We don't need God to create it because it's always been here from all eternity. That, that's an option if you want to reject Genesis 1-1. Or you can say something else. You can say the universe is not eternal. It didn't always exist. It just kind of popped into being uncaused out of absolutely nothing. And that's the only options you really have. You accept Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, or you say the universe is eternal, or you say it just kind of got here out of nothing for no reason. Now let's think about that for just a sec. This is not a philosophy course here. We're not going to get too deep into this, but we must think about these things. Let's take that first option. It, has the universe always existed? Has it always been here? Is it eternal? Well, without getting too complicated, can I just tell you this? If that were true, that would mean that the number of things that have happened in the history of the universe is eternal. Infinite. And we're not going to develop this, but I'll just please take my word for it. And if you don't, come see me afterwards. Scientists and philosophers have recognized for a long, long time that you cannot have an actually infinite number of anything. There's no such thing as a set with an infinite number of members. You can't have it. It's absurd. It leads to contradictions. So, long story short, if you want to believe, believe, right, faith commitment, if you want to believe that the universe is infinitely old, never began, your worldview, therefore, is irrational. It contains contradictions. And some people are okay with that. The Christian's not okay with that. Our God is consistent. He doesn't lie. We're not to lie. We're to think consistently, non-contradictorily, okay? Because that's how God thinks. So we reject that. Oh, here's another one, though. Did the universe just kind of pop into being uncaused out of nothing? That, that is the, that's really the one that a lot of people want to entertain now. And they're okay with it. They say, first there was nothing, absolutely nothing. And then... Now there's something, a universe, from nothing, by nothing, for no reason. A lot of people think that's okay to believe something like that. Okay, now let's think about that option, because that's the big one that a lot of people are holding to. What does that do for you and me? Can you really make sense out of the world? Can you live your life claiming to know certain things, if that's what you believe? Can you just imagine? If you really believed that things like a universe can just pop into being without a cause, for no reason, guess what you've just done, friends? Guess what you've just done? You have undercut the validity of all reason. Why? Because if you think that things can happen without a cause, that means you have no longer have any reason to trust your senses. Your senses just might, for no reason, be deceiving you. Your eyes might be deceiving you. Your ears might be deceiving you. Your memory might be deceiving you. If you believe the universe can just pop into existence for no reason, without a cause, we have no reason to think that we know anything about what's going on right now, or anything that might have happened in the past, or anything that might happen in the future. If you, really, if you put chance as ultimate, and that's what that view does, you really can't know anything. And yet, as we live and breathe and move and have our being, don't you think that you know some things? Don't you think you know some things? You say, I, I know that that preacher's talking about stuff that sounds pretty confusing to me. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully you're kind of getting it. You can't say chance is ultimate and then claim to know anything. If chance is ultimate, anything can happen. Anything could happen. Anything could be happening right now. 
You see, you got to come back to Genesis 1.1. You got to say, you know what? Somebody who knew what he was doing created the universe and he created it with a plan and a purpose and he made it intelligible. He made it in such a way that his intelligent creatures, and that's us, on a good day, <laughs> he made the universe in such a way that his intelligent creatures can make sense out of the place, can make plans for the future, you know, can look around and kind of make sense out of what's going on around here, can extrapolate into the future, kind of make plans for tomorrow, or retrodict into the past and kind of ascertain what happened yesterday. He made us with reliable, rational faculty. He made us with reliable senses and minds. And all comes back to Genesis 1.1. You're going to take Genesis 1.1 on faith, and then you can make sense out of life. Or you deny it, and life becomes absolutely unintelligible. It's just a big mystery. Chance is ultimate. Anything could be happening. You don't know anything. That's why Paul says, you know what? Those who resist God, deny him, ridicule him, they profess to be wise, but Paul says, guess what? They're fools. Why? They're fools because they have just written out of their worldview God, the only one who can help them make sense out of the world. And I mean that. And we could explore that much, much further, but let's just move on here, okay? In the beginning, God created, it says here, the heaven and the earth, okay? Now, what did he make in those heavens? Well, Psalm 103 tells us among the things that God created in the heavens was the third heaven. He created the third heaven. That's the place where his presence exists in a very special and unique way. And he filled that third heaven with creatures we call what? Angels. He would have made them on that first creation day as well. So how do you know that? Because he's going to create the earth next on that same day. And you know who's going to be there? Job 38 says the angels are going to be there. And they're going to rejoice at the earth being created. You say, I thought, I thought God existed in heaven from all eternity. And he was living there with the angels from all eternity. And then he created. That's, no, that's not true, friends. In the beginning, there was just God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit in love relationship. And at a, at a certain point, he created everything. He created heaven and he filled it full of angels. And then he created the earth and the angels rejoiced. You know why I think they rejoiced? Because Hebrews 1.14 says, angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister unto those who, who will be heirs of salvation. The angels knew that they had real work to do, real important work. And it concerned this planet called Earth. And that's on the first day of creation. God created the heaven, filled it full of angels. That's Colossians 1, if you're interested. Colossians 1, 15 and 16. Jesus Christ, the creator. By him were all things made, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers. The, those are the ranks of angelic beings. He created those and he filled heaven with them. The third heaven. It says in verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. You get the idea here that God's got an earth created, and, it's, and the earth looks like a gigantic shoreless ocean. It's just formless and void. It means it doesn't really have a form in the sense that it's just waves of water and no shorelines. And it's void in the sense that no one lives there yet. It's not a wreck or a ruin or a chaos. Let's, let's forget that kind of idea. Uh, it isn't that God created a world and it was really nice and then it got ruined. That's not what we see there. We see a place that's unformed and unfilled. That's all. It's perfect, but it's not complete. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of, of the waters and God said, let there be light. And there was light and God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, verse 5, and God called the light day, and he, the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. You know, uh, we're seeing something about God's authority here, aren't we? Uh, to begin with, the chasm between nothing and something is infinite. Would you agree? I mean, to get from absolutely nothing to something uh, you've got to cross an infinite chasm, and I think it, it, only an infinite God's going to be able to do that. The universe was not made out of God's body. The universe is not part of God. The universe is something totally different. It's, it's other, and God created it out of absolutely nothing. 
There's some authority there, okay? Psalm 135 says, God does what he pleases in heaven above, earth beneath, in all deep places. And then he creates this planet, and he says, let there be light, or maybe properly, light be. And then there's light shining on this planet. And he names the light, he calls it day. In darkness he calls night. You know, who, you know who does the naming around here? The one with the authority. Parents name their children. The guy with the authority does the naming, and we're going to see a little later on, Adam's going to name the animals, because he's the guy in charge. Well, guess who's in charge of heaven, earth, and light, and time, and space, and all of it? Well, God. And God's doing some naming here. By the way, some folks are going to look at this and say, wait a minute, the first day, look at uh, verse 5 there, the first day, how can you have a day? How can you have a real, literal 24-hour day? The sun hasn't even been created yet. Careful with that one. And God says, let there be light. He's not making the sun. He's making a special light to shine on that earth. Friends, all you need to have a literal 24-hour day is a fixed astronomic light source in reference to a rotating planet, and you can have a real day. And God's saying, trust me, this is a real day. One day has gone by here. It says in Psalm 74, 16, we have a real uh, distinction there between the light and the sun. God created the light, it says, and the sun. These are different things. Different names, too. Look at verse 6. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. What's that, What's that talking about there? What's happening? We have a... We have a rotating planet that's covered in water, a gigantic shoreless ocean, and God speaks to it. He has light shine on it, and then he speaks to it, and he says, let there be a firmament in the midst of those waters. What is a firmament anyways? It's an expanse. It's space. He's making an expanse there in the waters. He's going to tell us what he's doing here. Look at verse 7. God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. What's happening? Well, God is lifting waters from that ocean that's on the earth, and he's placing it up in the atmosphere. Two oceans in that early earth. And in between them, a place called heaven. Well, you're going to learn from verse 20 that that space between the two oceans is the place where the birds fly. So you can imagine an earth covered in water and an atmosphere above it, a place where the birds are going to fly, and above that you have water. Uh, that, now, it's not like that today. We don't see that much water up there today. Something's changed now. But you see, you've got to get your hand, uh, you got to get a handle on this. You've got to understand this. This is a different kind of world. Things changed at the flood. We'll get to the flood yet. Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9. Things are different. Peter called that the old world. And friends, you and I are not going to understand creation we're not going to understand that early world if we think by just looking at things today, we can extrapolate backward. God says, that's, you know, that's the way you can reason to a point, but at a certain point, you better take my word for it. Things were different. I changed things. So God creates this ocean above. He makes water behave in a way it doesn't normally want to behave. You can't put that much water in the atmosphere right now. But you want to know something? God can talk to water, and he can make water do what he tells it to do. He brought Moses to the shore of that Red Sea, and there he was hemmed in. Ocean in front of him, or Red Sea in front of him, might as well be ocean, deep enough. Mountains on either side, Pharaoh's army approaching from the rear. And there's Moses stretching his rod out over the water, and the water parts for him. And uh, Exodus 14, 15, it tells you a wall of water on either side. It says there in the, in the 15th chapter, the waters were congealed in the heart of the sea, hard as rock. He made walls. He really made walls of water for Moses and the children of Israel to pass through the Red Sea. When God wants water to behave, it will behave. I don't want to hear scientists tell me, well, water, you can't put that much water in the atmosphere. I don't really care. You shouldn't either. <laughs> God says, I did. trust me, I did it. Well, what purpose did it serve? Well, we can speculate, but at the end of the day, we don't know. But God says, you believe me. I was there. See, God has a tremendous advantage over any modern scientist today. He was actually there, and he did it. 
<laughs> Would you agree that's an advantage? That's a huge advantage. By the way, the Lord Jesus walked on the Sea of Galilee one day. Remember that? He said he walked, epi, in the genitive case. In the Greek, he walked upon that water. His sandals made contact with the water. The water was hard as rock, like a, like a sidewalk. The Lord Jesus made that water behave. God makes water behave, and it behaves. It says in verse 8, he called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, verse 9, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. You know, Psalm 95 says God formed the dry land with his hands, right? speaking anthropomorphically. He did it. You know, the modern scientist says today, you know, this is, this is absolutely ridiculous. You, you, planets take millions of years to evolve, and the, the land masses, current distribution and form of the continents and so on, doesn't that take millions of years to happen? God says, no. I did it all in six days. That's Exodus 20.11. And Moses wrote Exodus 20.11 with his own finger on a rock. And he said, in six days the Lord God made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Thank you. That's it. Everything in six days. Verse 10, and God called the dry land earth. There he is exercising authority once again. And the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Notice this, this phrase that's popping up every so often. God creates, and guess what? It's good. It's good. It's good. And this is going to become a very big point for us. When we look out into the world and we see all kinds of evil and human suffering and we want to shake our fist at God and we say, what kind of God are you to make a world that looks like this? What a nightmare this place is. And God says, you know, if you'll just take me at my word, you'll realize I'm no villain. I created the world and it was good. Right from the beginning, even the light was good. And you're going to see it all the way through. God made it good. Who wrecked it? We did. We don't, and we don't blame Adam. Not 100%. The Bible says we, we were in Adam. Right, Eve? <laughs> Very good. The Bible says in, in, in some way, shape, or form, we were in Adam. And every day of our lives, to one extent or other, we're, we are repeat performances too, aren't we? Yeah. Well, thank God Almighty, he doesn't turn his back on creation. God has a plan, a, a redemption plan to save you and I and to redeem the whole fallen creation. That's Romans chapter 8, right? How about that? All right, verse 11. God said, let the earth bring forth the grass and the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed is in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. Now you're going to get the sense here that everything that you read in the book of Genesis in terms of creation is absolutely the reverse of what you're going to read in any currently popular scientific textbook. And it's not our purpose in, uh, during this series in church to get into too much of the science here. This does relate to the things you're going to hear in science class, but it's not our purpose to preach too much of that, okay? You can go to Equip You Year 2. We have that online on the website. You get all kinds of information uh, on that. But just to say, this is absolutely reverse. I mean, here you have God. He says, I created the earth first, and then I created, you know, light, and I create dry land, and I put plants on the land, and guess what? The sun isn't even made yet. We don't even have a sun in the sky yet. And, the, you know, the modern scientifically-minded person says, this is crazy. Don't you know the sun comes first? And the earth is kind of birthed off the sun? And over millions of years, the earth kind of evolves into its current state or something similar? And then you get oceans appearing, and then you get little amoebas or something, you know, kind of swimming around in the ocean. And plants are latecomers. I mean, are you getting the sense that the Bible's completely the reverse? Can I make a suggestion why that is? God is omniscient, and God knew right well the great resistance that we would be experiencing towards this book in our culture. I mean, the number one argument against the Bible is what? Modern science has disproven it. 
The evolution story is a proven fact, and it totally invalidates what God says in the book of Genesis. That, I mean, that will always come up in every debate you've ever heard of Christianity versus, versus atheism. It always comes up. God says, you know what? Uh, you're not going to create some kind of blasphemous marriage with the pagan opinions out there. This is how I did it. It's completely different than what they're saying, and you're going to choose one or you choose the other. Right? Now, what's the smart thing to do? Uh, how about we just listen to God, take his word for it? Because the opinions of men are always changing. You know? You, take, you look at a textbook from the 1920s on earth history and historical geology, it's laughable. You know, when uh, alumni get together from some of these great institutions of higher learning, say guys who had been going to these universities maybe 40, 50, 60 years ago or so, they get together and they laugh about the stuff they learned in science class because all those things have been thrown out the window. But I tell you what, God honoring institutions of higher learning that were uh, purposed to teach the Bible. And those ones that were always, and they have towed the line all the way along, you know. When alumni get together to visit with one another decades later, they don't laugh about the things they learned because they learned the Bible. Is everyone kind of getting the point here? The Bible doesn't change. You build your life on it. Jesus said you better build your life on it because you build your life on any other foundation, the storms will come and wipe it clean, right? Wow. How did I even get there? <laughs> Here we go. Verse 14. This is astounding. Verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let there be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Don't you love that 16th verse? He made the stars also. Friends, there is more stars than we can possibly count. There's more galaxies than we can possibly count. Every one of them shining in the sky is a mystery. We have no idea how they got there. Secular science has some ideas, but none of them really work. If they're honest, they'll tell you. Stars just don't evolve, you know. And there's more stars shining there than we could possibly count. The universe so vast, so huge, so mysterious, so overpowering. And the text tells us almost as an afterthought, he made the stars also. Our, our sun is just a medium-sized star. You could put a million Earths in it. No problem. Isn't that incredible? Every galaxy, 150 billion stars. And now we know there's enough galaxies out there to equal the number of blades of grass you see in a meadow, at least. How'd they get there? He made the stars also. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Verse 17. God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day uh, and over the night to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. What are we talking, what are these two great lights? What's that lesser light? What do we call that one? The moon. And the greater light? The sun. Why did God wait four whole days? I mean, he created light on the first day, or light, the property of light. Day four, after plants have already been made, he creates meor, the light bearer, the sun. Why did he wait that long? I'd like to make a suggestion for you. These people that he's writing the book of Genesis to, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, they were steeped in paganism and adulterous worship of what? The sun coming out of Egypt. And you know, just about every ancient culture had a real problem with sun worship. Really. I mean, you can understand it too, can't you? I mean, morning by morning, that, that sun comes over the horizon it floods the world with light and heat and, and gives life to things. Plants don't grow without it. You know, you need it. And it's the most brilliant thing in the sky and the most awesome thing in the sky and ancient man began to worship the sun. And God says, well, we're going to straighten that out. I'm going to let you know something. I'm not even going to name this thing. I'll just call it a light in the sky. And God says, as a matter of fact, I created that thing on day four. It's not essential. You don't have to worship it. 
my plants were living just fine without it. I, God can keep plants alive without the sun, right? And you say, well, thank goodness I live in a culture where there is no, no sun worship here. We don't worship the sun in Canada, do we? Yeah, we do. Big time we do. You can go to the University of Manitoba or UW, whatever, go to any institution of higher learning, go to the high school and pick up a book on biology or earth science. Go ahead. You know what that book will tell you? It'll say five billion years ago, the sun existed as some kind of protostar in the center of a great rotating disk of matter and gas. And all of a sudden, that, that protostar collapsed on itself and it ignited into a main sequence star. We call it the sun. And all those chunks of matter that blew off that star, they, they cooled down and became the nine planets. And then radiation from the sun came and bathed the earth and engaged this experiment of living. And the first life got here because of solar radiation. And in the meantime, that life has evolved over millions of years, coaxed along as it was by the sun's radiation. And the sun today keeps you and I alive and all the plants and animals and trees. And at some point in the future, the sun is going to explode. It's going to nova. And when that happens, that'll be the end of all life on planet Earth. End of sun worship service. Right? The sun is your creator. It's the creator of life. It's the creator of the earth. It's the thing that keeps you alive today, and it is the determiner of your ultimate destiny. That, make, that means the sun's God, basically. That's blasphemous. And God knew that man would have a serious, serious problem with worshiping the sun. And so he said, well, as a matter of fact, I created it on day four. That goes for you pagans in Egypt. That goes for the children of Israel leaving Egypt. And it goes for us living in Winnipeg, Canada. Don't you dare worship the sun. And don't you dare warp and twist the book of Genesis to harmonize with the blasphemous pagan ideas that are currently popular in our schools. Paul, uh, Paul says it, but, but God says it. Don't do it. Don't you dare do it. Well, let's wrap it up. I'm, I'm never sure how far we're going to go week by week, and I don't want to overwhelm you. But let's think about what we learned today. God created the heaven and the earth. You know what that means? That means that God is all-powerful and he's everywhere present. I mean, there's not one single speck of matter out there that's as old as God. Did you know that? That means God is all-powerful. God is the one that is sovereign over the world, the material world. He's eternal, and he's everywhere present. He created space, right? That means he's not limited by space. That means God can be 100% with me as I do my best to preach to you. And he's 100% with you sitting there trying to make sense out of the things I'm saying. <laughs> Aren't you glad for that? Because <laughs> he's not limited by space. And that's very, very helpful. Well, let's say this. It's very convicting, isn't it? Uh, if you want to commit some secret sin that nobody's watching, even sinning in your mind and entertaining thoughts that you shouldn't be thinking, you're, you're, not, you're really not hiding yourself from God. Are you? No. He's not limited. You don't, there's no place you're going to go and hide from God. That's Psalm 139. The God who made the heaven and the earth, he's everywhere. He's got his eyes on you and me. Now, that sounds so terrible, doesn't it? Oh, God is just waiting to slap me down, isn't he? I, I knew it all along. No. No, no, you're supposed to be comforted by this. When I face temptation, God's not far from me. He can help me. When I want to repent, he's not far from me. He can forgive me. When I need strength to do the right thing, he's not far. He's not limited. He's not hiding off in some place. I don't have to call him on the phone or, and get a busy signal or get an answering machine or anything like that. God is, is close to me. Well, let's put it this way. He's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. See, that's, that's what it means to be the creator. See, that's why Genesis 1-1 is so important. And friends, I don't want you to think this is just some kind of hobby horse that I've got. We're going to go through the whole counsel of God. But do you understand how foundational and important these verses really, really are? Okay. Is that helpful to you guys today? Did we get to look at some things maybe in a different way today? I hope so. Okay, a word of prayer for us. Father, in Jesus' precious name, we thank you for the awesome privilege and, and uh, benefit of being here in your house, opening up the Bible, uh, and to 
consider again the wonderful things that are here for us. The challenging things, Lord, uh, things that really we just cannot fully, fully understand. But we ask, Lord, that you would move in our hearts. Uh, take what we've read here today. Make it, make it absolutely real to us. May we rejoice in the, the goodness of it all. May we begin to see the world the right way, the way you would have us to see the world, to interpret the world as you interpret the world. And Lord, to share this uh, with those who need to hear it. Help us to do it with love, Lord. Help us to do it with courage and to do it properly. And so we lift up these prayers to you, our great God and maker. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. Amen.